Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. So glad you're here today. We have a special treat for you. Today, today we'll be interviewing Sarah, who has had a history with Alcoholics Anonymous, and she's going to talk to us about its occult underpinnings and the, the occult background of its two founders, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith. And we are going to go deep into the origins of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we are going to learn from someone that's been in it just how deep you can go down the satanic rabbit trail of the occult in Alcoholics Anonymous and how deep they went. And we've already addressed that somewhat in our initial podcast where I called AA uh, Cyanide in the Sugar Cube. And we talked about how going to any other God but Jesus Christ is going to Satan. And there's no in-between, there's no gray area. And we're going to talk about how that's exactly what happened in the origins of AA. We're also going to talk about Sarah's testimony with regard to AA and how God's delivering her on, on his own, just as he did Evan in our last interview, and how he, Jesus Christ, is the deliverer and AA is not. But before we begin, let's pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you for this interview. I thank you for being with both Sarah and myself. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I bind up, rebuke, and command any demonic spirits that would try to interfere with this podcast and interview, either on my end or Sarah's end or in the ears of the listener. We bind you up, rebuke you, and command you to leave. Sarah, myself, as well as the listener, we bind you up from twisting words in our mouths or in the ears of the listener, and we loose that the truth would be spoken. Let no flesh speak, but let the truth come forth. And Father God, we just praise you and thank you that you're here. And we loose all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, and we bind up all these demons in the mighty name of Jesus. The name of Jesus at which every knee must bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we glorify Jesus in this podcast. And Father, we ask that you get all the glory for it, and thank you for just guiding it and, and being with us in the mighty name of Jesus. So just a little background for me. I've been exposed to A myself. I've never been through the program, but I've known a lot of people and have been involved in recover, Christian recovery programs, and I've seen um, AA throughout my entire life um, outside observer, and it never sat well with me. And of course... You know, I read into the big big book as I revealed in the podcast two podcasts ago, uh, and I began to see it's clearly an alternative religion. It's more like a cult, and it felt cultish to me. It felt like something was really wrong. And then I got an amazing email from our guest Sarah, and in in it she described basically why I was having that feeling. And other people commented in my initial podcast about its occult origins. And Sarah really uh, did a good job of opening up that further to me. And I definitely wanted to, after I read her email, I immediately wanted to interview her. And Sarah, I really want to thank you for being here, first of all. Yeah. I mean, anything to like warn people because I just don't think that people go in there with the intention that it's going to harm them. Right, and you wouldn't think that this organization that seems like it's meant to help people to get free of an addiction that that kills people, that hurts people, it causes se- you know, severe liver problems and, and bodily injury through car accidents, and yeah. I mean, so many ways it destroys families. And but Jesus is the deliverer, and I can't wait to to get to your testimony. But first, what we're going to do is we're going to address the occult origins, and I'm going to read some excerpts here, and then Sarah's going to comment to us uh, about her take on these things and the things that she learned on her travels. So the first thing I'm going to read to you is from CARM.org, and it's entitled Alcoholics Anonymous and the Occult. CARM stands for Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry. And so I'm going to lift from them this quote. It says, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded in 1935 by Will, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith. The official AA biography of Bill Wilson, entitled Pass It On, speaks of the co-founders practicing seances and communing with demonic spirits while writing the program for Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps. Bill Wilson explains one of their experiences with a Ouija board. 
And, in quotes, the Ouija board began moving in earnest. What followed was a fairly usual experience. It was a strange melange of, of Aristotle, St. Francis, diverse archangels and with odd names, deceased friends, some in purgatory and others doing nicely. Thank you. There were malign and mischievous ones of all descriptions telling of vices quite beyond my ken, even as former alcoholics. Then the seemingly virtuous entities would elbow them out with messages of comfort, information, advice, and sometimes just sheer nonsense. And I will comment on Ouija boards. If you want a sure way to get demonized and filled with demons inside your soul and spirit, you mess with a Ouija board or any other occult device and you will become, excuse me, fully demonized forthwith. And that is basically like... You know how you can invite Jesus to come live in your heart? People call it the sinner's prayer. Well, if you want to invite demons to come live with you, you mess with getting knowledge or information from any other source other than God the Father through Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what they did. They were conducting witchcraft. Continuing on with the quote, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith were originally introduced to each other in 1935 by a woman named Henrietta Sieberling. In a letter she wrote on July 31st, 1952, she tells of Bill Wilson's communion with demonic spirits during the time he was writing the Alcoholics Anonymous program. Quoting uh, Miss Sieberling, she says, he imagines himself all kinds of things. His hand, his hand writes dictation from a Catholic priest whose name I forget from the 1600 period who is who was in Barcelona, Spain. Again, he told Horace Crystal he was completing the works that Christ didn't finish. And according to Horace, he said he was a reincarnation of Christ. Perhaps he got mixed in whose in whose reincarnation he was. It looks more like the works of the devil, but I could be wrong. I don't know what is going on in that poor, deluded fellow's mind. So here we have him channeling from a so-called Catholic priest from the 1600s. He's channeling demons. This is how he was writing. He was channeling demons. Continuing, even the symbol adopted by Alcoholics Anonymous, the triangle within a circle, is occultic in origin. Regarding the symbol, Bill Wilson stated, that we have chosen this symbol for AA is perhaps no mere accident. The priests and seers of antiquity regarded the circle enclosing the triangle as a means of warding off the spirits of evil. An AA circle of recovery, unity, and service has certainly meant all that to us and much, much more. Well, ironically, the circle and the triangle, of course, are Illuminati and Masonic symbols. Uh, the all-seeing eye and, of course, being the circle and the triangle representing the... Uh, Pyramids, representing the pyramid. So uh, it's no surprise to me that something that has an occult origin would have a triangle and a circle in it from, from my perspective. So having read you that, we clearly see an occult connection. And I have to say that I have felt the with many of the AA sponsors I've known, I felt like they were so aggressive to sell AA. It felt like they were a priesthood a priesthood and a satanic priesthood at that. They, they don't know it. They think they're helping people, or maybe some of them do know it, but there is definitely a satanic, a satanic priesthood at work. All right, we have one other excerpt to read from, and then we're going to get uh, Sarah's uh, take on all this. Now I'm pulling from a website called AA Agnostica, and this is in the section that he titles Spiritualism. He says... Here's a rather startling statement from Bill's biographer, Matthew J. Raphael. He says, It might be said that, for the co-founders at least, AA was entangled with spiritualism from the very beginning. Today this is a somewhat puzzling statement, but it needs to be put in context with the era during which they both came of age. During the late 19th century and continuing throughout the first third of the 20th century, there was a considerable interest among the general populace of North America, as well as esteemed psychologists, including Jung, Freud, and James, regarding spiritualism and the occult. Both Bill and Dr. Bob were most interested in parapsychology, the study of paranormal mental phenomena, often excluded from study by mainstream psychology. Paranormal phenomena include hypnosis, telepathy, clairvoyance, remote viewing, etc. Letters from Bill to Lois while he stayed in Akron with Dr. Bob and his wife, Anne, during 1935 include several references to seances they conducted seeking to contact departed spirits. Finally, I'm going to finish with the idea that Bill was also very much into experimenting with LSD. 
AA's official biography, Pass It On, reports Bill was enthusiastic about his experience with LSD. He felt it helped him eliminate barriers erected by the self or ego that stand in the way of one's direct experience of the cosmos and of God. So everything I just read you, as someone myself who studied the occult and studied the paranormal, studied what what the occult really is, is a mystery. It's getting things in knowledge or information or power from any other source and God the Father through Jesus Christ and his word. And from what I've shown you from their own quoting from their own books, these people were steeped in the occult and witchcraft. And you can't start what some people call a Christian organization using witchcraft. God is not a mixture. He is all Christianity. He's all Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life as we established in the first podcast. And no man goes to the Father but by him. And these people were literally leading people away from the true Christ. Even though they offer the opportunity to choose Christ as your God in that the fact that they leave it open to all other gods, whatever, however you define them, means you're serving a false god. Jesus Christ did not make himself available to, to, to be compared to any other god. He was very exclusive. And anything, any organization that calls itself Christian has to remain as Jesus was, and that's exclusive. Okay, so we read a lot there, Sarah, and I just want you to dive in and, and, and take us on, take us through what you experienced and, and the things that you, that you learned, especially that what you revealed to me in the email that you sent. I ended up getting a DWI and I ended up after the DWI, that was in like September of 2016. I went sober without any kind of treatment, nothing. And in hindsight, that was really the deliverance. But it would be much longer before I would actually wrap my head around it because there was a lot going on when you get charged with the DWI. You know, I layered up pretty high. So many months later, I found myself downtown at the courthouse, government center, really. And when I was about six months sober, I that's when I went to treatment. So I took things kind of unusually because usually people go to treatment and then they sober up. But I had gotten sober and that's why I say that deliverance happened so early. And then when I went to to like enroll in in a treatment center, I think they thought I was in denial because they accepted me, but I really was sober for like 6 months at that point. But I needed Were you to forced to, to enroll? I wasn't forced. Um, when you're like in the pattern of addiction, though, you don't have your wits about you. You don't have your judgment. And I had been drinking for a long time. So it took me about six months for that fog to lift and for me to realize like how much not only trouble was I in, but how much all that drinking had really impacted my life. And that was without any treatment at all. That was just, you know, me and God and working through and like introspection and just the like. So I didn't end up in the, they call it a diversion court um, or they call it restorative justice. I called it destructive justice, (laughs) but um, I didn't end up in that until... May of 2017. So I was a very unusual client because I did not use the program's like prescribed treatment plan because I had already done it from a Christian. I did 45 days in rehab and then I did another, I was like halfway through another 10 weeks of outpatient. So they couldn't really inject their prescribed form like treatment plan on me because I was already ahead of the ball. Whereas the remaining clients had to go through their recommendations. And so on set, everybody knew I was Christian because I went to Christian recovery. Uh, So once you got in there, how through the DWI court, how did they direct you into the AA book study sessions? 
So initially they have, so they had four volunteers, two theologians, and then they had two sponsors. And one day my lawyer shows up with me at, this is like, they give you like a probationary period because they want to vet you and make sure that you are somebody that is going to take to their program because it's difficult. Um, it's 18 months long. It's a minimum of 45 um, hearings in front of an entire courtroom. It's a weekly UA, and there's also a sheriff who comes by your house randomly and gives you, he checks to make sure that you're on curfew, and he'll give you like a breathalyzer. So it's very intense. So if you don't finish the program, they can go back and enforce that entire jail sentence. For me, it was 30 days. And at that point, I, so it is a voluntary program and I accepted the program because again, I didn't realize I was like, I didn't realize that I had been delivered until I went through all the trials of the program. Well, in a way, it's good that you went through it so you can tell us about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, honestly, it was a blessing. Like they say blessings are usually trials and then obedience at the end is, you know, is kind of the the silver lining. And boy, was it a blessing. What were some of the things that started to stand out to you as you began to attend those meetings? So they were vetting me. And so initially when you enter... Before you even know anything about the program, you have to meet with these two AA sponsors. And these are court appointed AA, um, AA sponsors. And one of them actually graduated the program. The program had been in the government center for about 10 years. And when one of the gals graduated this DWI court 10 years ago, she started running AA out of the the courthouse. So um, so I met with them, and my lawyer actually said something to me about it. He said, "Did you notice that he was talking directly to you?" And I didn't really think anything of it, but now, in you know, in hindsight, they really they knew that I was going to be tricky. And because I had come from Christian um, treatment and initially the one guy said to me, he said, Sarah, you don't believe in all that God stuff, do you? And he saw the horror. He saw the horrified look on my face. And I said, yes, because, again, they just they knew that I had come from Christian treatment. The irony of that is the 12 steps mentions God all the time. But as long as it's any other God but Jesus Christ, they're fine with it. Well, it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to somebody who isn't devout or obedient, you can lie to them and they won't know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it depends on it. It also depends on how how hot your faith is. You know, if you're a lukewarm and you're just categorically Christian, you're not going to pick up on any of it. Mm-hmm. So, um, so they vetted me and initially they just feed you in teaspoons. So they talk a lot about their own testimonies and they knew I was Christian. And, um, I remember the, the female sponsor, she would, she would mention her, you know, the fact that she was a Sunday school teacher and she would use amen to end her sentences with me, which I thought I felt like it was insincere to me. But yeah. you're in you're a client. You've been charged with a crime. And I actually looked at the I didn't I was ignorant to AA and I didn't know of any of the occult. I, I knew nothing. I was completely oblivious to it. And I thought, this is a good thing. This will give me a nice little base tan in sobriety. That was my, you know, I knew that I was no longer going to stay in that gray area. So I um, I committed to the program. I got through the first month and um, they started turning up the heat on 
AA because again, they're not calling the meeting that I'm attending AA. They're calling it parachute. So unless you know the 12 steps, you don't actually know that you're in an AA meeting and that you're being indoctrinated. I didn't know any of the steps. I was so ignorant to it all. So eventually after they both, you know, charmed you with their testimonies, um, they started revealing these steps to you. So like the first step was powerlessness. And keep in mind, I'm almost a year sober. So I know for a fact that I'm not powerless to alcohol, but everybody else in this room has gotten sober using this DWI court program, which is basically AA court is what it is. And um, it's basically government indoctrination into AA. Yep, it's AA court. And that's the tricky part is that the courts have ruled that AA is a religion. So they can't, they cannot mandate, like the judge and the people on the bench, they can't mandate you to attend AA, but they can trick you and they can use illegitimate authority in the form of AA volunteers in the courthouse and they can influence you as long as it's not somebody on the bench doing it. So it's just, I mean, but they're not going to tell you your rights. You really have to be your own advocate. And like I said, in my BC days, I would have never known that I was into something that was so satanic because I was lost. I didn't know. I mean, I was following a God of my own understanding. How could I, you know? I was totally lost. So it wasn't until I became Christian two years before that you have to study. You know, you have to you have to reject everything that you thought you knew and start over. You made this list that you called the horrifying AA theology and and includes and you have like six bullet points there. At what point did those what, what point did those I'd like you to address those, but at what point did those begin to manifest themselves? Like you started to realize that, you know, like your first one, you say, make, make your God, your God can be a doorknob or a group of drunks. Uh, and that's basically imagined from Satan himself is what you said there. So what point did all that start to come about? Within four weeks, as soon as they got through, as, as soon as the two sponsors got through their own story and, you know, how they, ended up being an AA, immediately they went into step one. And then the following week when I went to court, this meeting would happen right after my hearing and they would do step two and step three and so on. And I think the, and I mean, I'm quoting exactly what they would say to me. And I was in a group. So there were probably seven, eight clients, we were all in like a jury deliberation room because it would occur right after DWI court. And the judge actually had like a way to get you in there by saying that this will count for two for one. So instead, you had to maintain three meetings a week as well, in addition to all the UAs and everything else. So So she would encourage people, she would motivate people to go into that jury deliberation room under a name called parachute meeting, and she would call it a two-for-one. So there was a lot of finesse going on there, for sure. Yeah, it highly highly motivated you to attend because it was going to help you, you know, graduate from the program. Well, that and... When you're in a courtroom, that judge has power and you don't want to get on her bad side. <laughs> you really don't. She's a classic narcissist. But um, but yeah, so we all went out of obedience, all of us. And it wasn't until they started. Um, it was the God thing that bothered me the most because Like, I could just hear that would be totally out of Satan's mouth. Like, just make, you know, you know, it's just, it's absurd to me. So 
at that point, I stopped attending those meetings. And right, tell me some of the things that they said that you you listed in your email. Um. Well, they're very clever and very compelling people. Both of the sponsors are. And um, so one of the things that really horrified was horrified me was when they said that when people they said, you know, your only option is AA jails, institution or death. And they really fear monger you with this idea. And so you really only think that those are your options. And you do start to think that you have a disease and that the only way to be delivered is this AA program. They're um, very compelling people. I mean, these are sponsors in the criminal. They're not your average, you know, neighborhood sponsors. They are um, very effective, very gifted in speaking, and that's why they were in that courthouse. Um, so the you can choose a god of your own understanding. You can make a group of drunks your god. You know, like the acronym G O D, group of drunks. You can make. I mean, those were the things that bothered me. The the those were the most horrifying things, but. You're in an hour long session with them and you're and they're speaking in a very, you know, calm tone and you're just trying to take it all in and you're rejecting half of what they're saying. But you're sitting there out of obedience. It's just Mm -hmm. absurd. I mean, you're being subjected to Satanism. Yeah. I. So what did they tell you about the spook room in Dr. Bill's house and all that? So when I stopped attending those indoctrination meetings, meaning the 12 steps, they would walk you through these 12 steps every week. When I stopped attending those um, and I would just walk out of the courthouse and that's when the judge mandated me to attend big book theology. And I was the only client who had to do it. And it's because I was not attending the parachute meetings. So that was her catch 22. So I'm sitting, so for, I want to say two, three months, I showed up to the courthouse early and these two 70 year old guys were sitting on the bench and they would read to me the first 170 pages from Alcoholics Anonymous. And they had spent so many years in Alcoholics Anonymous because they were old timers and they were like, probably 70, um, that they really knew the ins and outs of AA. They had gone to um, Stepping Stones, which is apparently his home in upstate New York. They had attended the New York meetings. They were enmeshed They in AA. They had leather bound. You know, they had rebound their AA books like it was a Bible. I mean... It was absurd, but I was, um, the very first thing that they said to me was, Bill wasn't a very good guy. And they talked about his womanizing and that he was into dark things. And I, I said, what kind of dark things? They don't know I'm Christian. And, um, they said, well, he liked to have, people over and he liked to talk to spirits in this room and the one theologian had actually been to the the room himself and he was proud of it and he didn't know I was disturbed by it because I just you know I'm the only one there and these guys are I I didn't know that I was dealing with volunteers I thought these were like paid you know, people of the government. I had no idea. I was so, I was in over my head. But, so throughout the program, um, you know, they would read to me the book and they would give me a lot of advice. So they talked to me about the fact that, you know, Bill was into Ouija boards and seances and they mentioned that some people in AA like to go through the Alcoholics Anonymous book and pick out words throughout the text and then 
mix them in a different way. And it's supposed to be some kind of like esoteric knowledge. I don't know if it's the stuff that they would use in the seances. I didn't really dive deep into it. And most of the time I wasn't even doing the talking. It was them. Um, very rarely did I see anything to, to both of these people. It was the lecture is what it was. So this goes on and there were some really big red flags and it's just interesting to me that they were offering up information, which is exactly in line with what I read to you from, from those other sources about the occult aspects of the underpinnings of AA and they freely admitted it. Well, their show didn't last long. That was the last time that they um, had that big book study. And I squawked about it because I knew it was creepy. And I said something. I had to also meet with my probation officer every week. And I said something to her about it. And um, they're in a courtroom. So they're videotaped. And... If I'm making a fuss about it, about it, but I was kind of jovial about it. I'm like, you know, it's it's an AM radio station is what it is to me because they're fascinated with it and I'm not. So it became very clear that I was not easy to persuade, that I wasn't going to be, uh, okay, now I'm an AA type of client. Um, but I wasn't seeing a whole lot. I just was not real enthusiastic. I wasn't taking notes in my big book. I wasn't um, accepting um, everything that they said. And at one point, one of the only things I said to these two men was he had said that I said, you know, I did do um, a tw- what like a Christian 12 step while I was in um, treatment. And he said, and he yelled at me and he said, take the cotton out of your ears. He said, if you don't say it to a sponsor, it doesn't count. And I was like, look at that manipulation. A sponsor is more, you know, it, it was ludicrous. That sponsor is nothing compared to Christ. You know what's funny is that in some ways it sort of reflects what goes on in the Catholic Church where you have to make confession mm-hmm. to the priest oh, and yeah. they, they get all this information on you. And that all stems from paganism and Satanism. You know, God, we do confess our faults one to another, but uh, in the end, we need to have our relationship short, short up with God the Father through his son Jesus Christ. And our our confession and our, our hearts, what's really in our hearts is is for him first and foremost. And if he leads us to tell someone to help someone else or to help ourselves, that's one thing, but it's never forced. It's not uh, a sin if you don't share with a sponsor or a priest uh, your sins. They can't forgive you. <laughs> but yeah, and then, they, and then they use that information to manipulate you or to get their rocks off, you know. Uh, that is exactly what was, and it took me a while but that's they they I watched them exploit another client and she was like a frenemy to me in this program. So it goes on and I finished their little big book study session and I find out that they're going to cancel the big book study program and I'm like, well that's kind of a shame because that's where everybody learns the truth. But the reality is is that if you're not if you don't have Christ, I don't think you're going to see as much wrong with it. You know what I mean? Like, how could you think, right? You're lost. I mean, so then after that, um, I connected back with those cause I went on a little segue into big book study and everybody else stayed in those indoctrination meetings. And then I reconvened with them. And the next meeting I went to, this was like over a period of what? three months. It was like the first three months of this whole program. And I reconvened with them. And that's when they got into your classic AA format meeting, meaning, hi, my name's Sarah. I'm an alcoholic. And then you confess whatever step you're on and everybody, you know, you're, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like showboating, you know, like I would listen to people and when they would get to the point, there's like a, one of the steps is about your character defects. 
And even that sponsor, oh, a lot of times their character defects were things that they were really actually quite proud of. So the one sponsor would say um, that he stole, he like made counterfeit credit cards for American Express to the tune of like $200,000 or whatever. Like I, I wasn't necessarily believing people because their stories were kind of embellished to me and oh, so, nothing about it sat right with me. Um, it was um, really just a platform for people who are really indoctrinated to show off and for the rest of us to be impressed. That's what it felt like. And I didn't speak the language. Um, uh, so when I went to, when I got out of big book theology, um, I used like a little trick that I, you know, I had studied group dynamics in college. So I broke every single norm that they had thinking that I would get shunned because I just wanted nothing to do with this. And they came out to me and they said, you know, Sarah, we don't ask any questions in our meetings and we always introduce ourselves as alcoholics. And I'm like, okay. And they said, um, but keep coming back. The program works if you work the program. So my little like trying to get, you know, ejected from the group didn't work. So that was the last meeting I went to. I was done. And for the next eight months, I was in phase two. So every other week I had to go to that courthouse. And those sponsors globbed on to me like white on rice. And every single time court let out, all the other clients would go to the jury room for parachute and I would put on my coat, walk out the other door. And there was an, there was an article in the paper about one of the sponsors and, um, and the judge was quoted in it too. And she said, you know, Ralph, this sponsor, he has a really, he can delicately balance between guilt and shame. And I thought, Man, I am, I'm like, that's what he's doing to me. Like here I get up and I leave every single time. And that's why he's playing good cop, bad cop with me all the time. Like one day he's favorable towards me. The next day he's, he abhors me. And I mean, it was just, it was sounds like the narcissistic sweet mean cycle, doesn't it? And the judge, those were her flying monkeys. I mean, it was heavy narcissism because the judge can't impose it. So she farmed it out to these AA sponsors. And every time I reject them, they're injured because all they want is for me to go into that room. And they get their kicks on manipulating people is really what it is. And you know what's funny is they'll even try to manipulate people that aren't addicts at all or never had any trouble with it just into buying uh, what they're selling. They, they want mm -hmm. everybody to agree that this is the only way to go. There is no other way. And if you don't agree with them, so they're going to attack you for sure. It's power. That's what it is. It's mm -hmm. power. They feel power when they can control and manipulate others. And when you don't obey them, they're injured because mm -hmm. that means they're not special. They're not, they're not as powerful as they think they are. And people so, in their seventies, like those two guys they, that had given huge swaths of their lives to this, this cult, this religion, anybody that could, uh, be, could pose a threat to the idol that they built of it. I mean, they, that must injure them all the more because at this point it'd be so hard to admit that, golly, I've done something really evil here. I thought I might be no. helping, but I really made the wrong decision. You can't deprogram somebody who's been through thought reform because the last thing that they're going to do is admit that, like, that they're going, that they were duped. That is a very, very difficult, like think it of takes Jesus. It, it really, that's the only way that you can deprogram 
It really is because you're just lost to it. It's that effective. So this goes on and eventually I like evade enough meetings and we like anybody in the room could tell that I was being pressured to go. And I was gracious about it, but I just was like, you know, no, AA is a complete mockery of my faith. I won't do it. And uh, finally, the judge said to me one day in court, she said, you know, if it's one thing, you're consistent. And <laughs> I had been working a pretty strong program. I mean, I was in I was in school. I was rebuilding. I was doing everything I needed to do. And the outpatient had even asked me to do like a leadership development program. The only difference was that I wasn't using AA. That was the problem. She got her kicks on watching people go through the AA process. And I, as an observer, was horrified. So this goes on and eventually I hit phase three and I had been so psychologically manipulated and emotionally manipulated that I was, they got to me. I mean, in the beginning, it was really easy to just walk out the door, but it eventually wears down on you. And, um, so when I got to, phase were you ever three, afraid they would retract your, the benefits that you were deriving from going through the process? No, because I knew the law. I knew the establishment clause. The establishment clause says that AA is considered a religion, and the judge never forced me. It was the sponsors. They didn't work for the government, so they weren't breaking the law. They were... Did you ever confront you know, them? The sponsors? Yeah, did you ever say, look, I don't want to hear your dribble anymore. I'm done. No, because I just said I was not going to their meetings every time. I, I didn't feel like I owed them any explanation, and I knew that they were narcissistic. Mm. You just you, – you stay away from those people. I knew they were toxic. I knew they were manipulators. Um, I They were like chasing the wind. That's what they were doing. And – the one would always try and befriend me, and that's what's tricky because you can't call her out on it. You know, you know that she's manipulating you, and you know that she's insincere, but if she's, you know, superficially kind to you, you can't say anything to her, you know? So they were tricky. They were what I call very complicated people. Yeah, it's a, but, it's a big um, setup because if you did call her out, she's like, I'm just trying to be helpful. Why are, you, why are you attacking me? Absolutely. You were, I mean, there was no way around it. The only thing I could say was I'm not going to your meeting. If I bashed AA to them, that's a setup too because then they right. start calling me a dry drunk. That's a very common term in AA. If somebody sobers up, and I was almost a year sober. If somebody sobers up without AA, they're a dry drunk. So I knew they never told me that to my face, but I knew enough of the theology from um, those big bookers. There was one thing I did leave out. The, the most horrifying thing that I heard from the theologians were um, the one guy was a lot nicer to me, and he... Uh, I mean, he, he was a, like a codependent. That's how I would describe him. And then the other guy was pretty narcissistic. He was the guy who was really proud of the fact that he had swindled American Express out of so much money and da da da. But they had said something, the most horrifying things that they said to me about the group itself was um, apparently on page 69, they start talking about um, promiscuity in AA. And the guy said to me, you know, don't have any relationships within your first year. And because he alluded to promiscuity in the group. And then he also alluded to suicide by saying everybody knows somebody who commits suicide in AA. And earlier they had said, um, you know, your only option is AA 
institution, jail, or death. So they like their sacrifices, was, satanic organizations. That's how I felt. I am like, you're condoning human sacrifice. Those lives don't matter because your life matters more. And so it was, it was pretty horrific. Um, so yeah. I get to phase three and the judge hates me. Everybody, everybody in the room hates me because I am that minority influence who just won't I won't even entertain their meetings. Everyone else, I'm sure, thought it was poor theology, too, but they were more obedient. And I studied obedience and conformity and all of that. So I knew you should just avoid these people. They're manipulative. You remind me of the book of Daniel, like when Daniel was put in the lion's den because he wouldn't conform or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put in the fiery furnace because they wouldn't conform. But mm-hmm. doing when you do something like that for God, he does great miracles for you. And, I mean, when you're relegated to that role of black sheep, that's a trial that you're going to go through, and you just, you know, you're being tested. And God tests Satan tempts. They were tempting me over and over and over again. And I just stayed obedient. But towards the end, I just felt like the dog everyone had tried to kick around. Do you know what I mean? So Uh, I got to phase three and the evaluator said to me, she started talking to me about AA. And I was just like, you guys have got to be kidding. I have not you guys have harassed me about this the whole time, and I I clearly have now a track record in which I am not going to be an AA zombie. So I let the cat out of the bag, and I said, AA is thought reform, and I will not have anything to do with it. And thought reform is something that I had studied. It's a systematic way to change people's behaviors and perceptions. And I won't do that because I could, you know, obviously, once you're in Christ, nobody can snatch you. However, I don't want my faith tainted with that. They would chew me up and spit me out anyway. Let's be honest. You know, I would be a sheep among wolves anyway. So I said the words thought reform and then when I got back to my to the to the courtroom somebody in the courtroom it was kind of like a kind of like a recess we were all in the courtroom but somebody had said well there's many st- you know there's many paths to sobriety there's this that and the other thing and I'm sitting here thinking and I'm like What a joke. I'm like, the only way to sobriety in this room is if you attend AA. And so I was thinking to myself and I made a comment and I said, and it just rolled off my tongue. And I said, or join the, I said, or join the occult. And I was talking about, I was talking about Bill Wilson, but it was very subtle because only people who know Bill Wilson's Ouija board and seances would know that I was talking, that I was bashing AA. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it just, and the girl next to me, she was, um, she was a, she was the golden child and she was always really nice to me and really friendly to me. But, um, I never, she and I weren't, good friends because we had gone to an AA meeting earlier and I said Jesus in the AA meeting. And so she knew I wasn't, you know, on her team, so to speak. So she and I were acquaintances in this courtroom and she shamed me for saying the words, the occult. And I realized that the occult is a very controversial word. However, At that point, I knew she knew that Bill Wilson was an occultist because that's why she shamed me for it. And she she just said, whoa, you know, that was her response to me making this comment. And to be honest, it just rolled off my tongue. I just 
you know, I heard somebody say that there's all these paths to sobriety. And I was just like, not in this court. There isn't. It's just AA. So I was making, I was mocking Bill Wilson is what I was doing. And I said it quietly and just to myself. So, so I was playing with fire and like 15 minutes earlier, I had said, I won't do AA because it's thought reform. So these are two dirty little secrets that I just kicked out in one day in court. And um, I go to court the following month. I get and no, I actually had to come back two weeks later. I had to go back two weeks later because they didn't approve my phase three immediately. They um, and so I went to court two weeks later and this defense attorney, you know, it's an entire, all the pomp and circumstance of regular court, attorneys, clerks, whatever. And they so they got to make their money, right? Oh, uh, well, it's intimidating too. I mean, that really enforces obedience in you. So, I mean, no wonder why I was so trained, but they, um, so this defense attorney starts the hearing off and something's not right. It's feeling orchestrated and it's feeling very calculated. And he starts talking and he's talking to a guy who's allegedly graduating the program. And he starts saying, all you had to do, he's like, you know, you were a model client. You kept your mouth shut. All you had to do is keep quiet. And he says this gag order like statement probably seven or eight times. So he's not being very subtle, hmm. but he's not, but he's not directly speaking to me either. It was very manipulative. So he, at the very end though, he says, and he looks directly at me and he says, all he's like, just keep your damn mouth shut. And then he gives me that like power stare. So well, what were you I, saying when he told you to, to do that? Nothing. I had said nothing. It wasn't, it wasn't anything that I had said that hearing. It was because I said thought reform and I referenced the occult on my last hearing. Oh. So he so, was giving you a, a rap on the wrist, on the on the forehand for that. He was disciplining me like, hey, you're playing with fire. And so I'm sitting there. And it was, you know, it would be one thing. He wasn't my attorney. I had a private attorney. So he didn't really have a reason to, you know, counsel me on anything. So it, it was out of the blue. And he was very threatening about it. And you could hear a pin drop in that room. That's how serious it was. And all of a sudden, out of the peanut gallery <laughs> behind me, that frenemy girl of mine started laughing. And then she echoed what he said. So she gave out this big laugh. And it was so wildly inappropriate because it was a pretty serious moment. And I look over at the probation officer and her jaw is on the floor because this is another client. And it was a very smug thing to do because. Well, she is tattled on you for sure. She probably talked to that attorney about what you had said. Wouldn't you say? Here's the kicker. She doesn't know anything about thought reform. She only knows about the occult statement that I made. Mm -hmm. And again, the occult isn't the dirty little secret to them. The thought reform is the dirty little secret to them because as a client, I'm not supposed to know that. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't know. She thinks that I'm being disciplined for the occult comment. And I wholeheartedly disagree. I think I'm being disciplined because I identified thought reform mm -hmm. and um which means so brainwashing it means brainwashing and thought reform is the academic term for it if i would have just used the term brainwashing they wouldn't have taken me seriously but because i knew the academic term for it that makes you know that makes it legitimate and 
not that many people know anything about it. You know, like you would have to know, but it was in my college major. I mean, that was my major was like group dynamics. So I had done a whole module on cults. So, and it was, it was happening at the time I was going through this entire program. So I was learning, you know, every week I was being indoctrinated. And then during the, during the earlier part of the week, I was learning all about power, obedience, conformity, all of these things. So it was kind of like my armor, to be honest, you know, it was simultaneous. This is the part where I made a mistake because after I went home, I prayed about it big time because here I got kicked in the gut. Not only by it didn't even the attorney actually didn't bother me too much because I kind of agreed with them, you know, like here I am playing with fire and not even knowing it. But but, yeah, but was, sometimes that, God has people say things because he doesn't want the evildoers to, to, to think they're actually getting away with something. Right. And I was scared at that point because I'm like, you know, I'm looking at things. I'm like, okay, so they kick me out of the program and then I have to do jail and I've lost all this time and whatever. So, but I think what really bothered me is that that other client was exploiting me. You know, here she was playing friends with me and then really just using me to smell like a rose. You know, if she got me to go to those meetings, she could smell like a rose. And the judge had already created that dynamic. Um, it's really common in like narcissistic homes for there to be this black sheep and this golden child. And right. it's like a vicious cycle. And that's what was going on in that courtroom. And it really bothered me, but I did get to phase three. And so I was pretty pumped about that because that means that I only had to deal with this for once, once every month versus every other week. And um, that was the last time I saw those AA sponsors. Are you still in yeah. phase three or have, are you, are you done? I'm in phase three. Yep. So once a month, what happens now? A, with the court? Yeah. Well I, well, I didn't say. So the next time I went to court, they were gone. They both got reassigned. Mm. The judge, the attorney, and those AA volunteers haven't seen any of them since. Wow. And like after I got disciplined by that attorney, all, you know, I prayed about it and I just kept hearing, um, it is finished. It is finished. And I'm Praise like, Lord, what's finished, you know? And then come to find out, I go to court the next, the next time and they've all been reassigned. It's done. Wow. So now when you go to court, it's a completely different judge, a completely different set of attorneys, and you just yeah. show up and go through the motions and then leave. There's no more harassment. Sick. There's no more, like, narcissism. You know what I mean? And if it's there, it must be, like, it's not enough for me to pick up on because I'm only there once a month. But, so, I mean, it's not, there's no emotional manipulation. It's not gamey. It's not, not any of these things. And they're really nice to me because they they have to be. I mean, if I let out the cat, I mean, if I say the occult to a non-Christian, they're not going to care that I said that. But if I say thought reform, and I, t and I explain to them what thought reform is, they could pick up on it. You know what I mean? So, like, for me, the thought reform was what I was not supposed to talk about because right. the occult aspect, that was told to me in their big book study. So you can't get upset with me because your volunteers told me that he was into that kind of thing anyway. So it was the thought reform. And I just look back on the whole experience and I'm like, that really tested my faith and it really made me a lot stronger in my faith. And, um, I made some mistakes along the way and, um, just in terms of just 
getting angry and frustrated with, you know, how much they had like zeroed in on me. And, um, you know, when I pray about it, it's like my grace is sufficient. And then the very last thing was like the most, you know, God always speaks to me through his word. And, you know, you can read verses so many different ways, depending on whatever you're looking for. And, you know, when I looked back on that, and um, that verse that's in, it's either in first or second Corinthians, and it talks about how God uses weak people to shame the mighty, and he right. uses fools. Foolish people to shame the wise. And I'm right. in a courtroom with like, these people have like juris doctoral degrees. They're not stupid. And I'm the Christian. They think I'm like irrational and crazy. They're like, why don't you just go to those meetings there? But, um, they don't, they don't have that kind of faith where they have to be obedient. You know, if I would have gone to those meetings, Satan would have chewed me up and spit me out. And, um, and then I looked at, you know, here I'm pretty weak. I mean, I'm like five foot two. Everybody in this room has a lot of power. I hate going up and speaking to the judge. It makes me so anxious. And, um, you know, I just look and then even alcohol itself. I mean, alcohol will make you really weak. You drink alcohol and you can go when you're sober, you're strong and mighty. And when you're drinking alcohol, you can't even keep your legs straight, you know. So and then you also do so many foolish things. So not only do I look at that and I'm like, well, he really shamed them. But I also look at it as like the alcohol itself, you know, I mean, I really was into all the foolish things of the world and they shamed me in this destructive justice program. But, you know, everything, everything really increased my faith. It, um, it made me more obedient is what it did. That was the only time that my faith had really been tested. Terrible experience, but... What a testimony. You know, a lot of us have been tested by narcissists, whether it's through programs such as AA with their thought reform and brainwashing or from narcissists that are our bosses or people that we live with or are married to, parents, you know, siblings. I mean, there's schoolmates. Uh, there's so many ways to be narcissistically controlled. And, and what's unique about or maybe not unique about your situation, but it happens in various realms is when someone's an authority over you that is trying to abuse you. And, and that theme runs throughout, throughout the scripture. Uh, imagine, um, Joseph in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife was trying to manipulate him and all the things yeah. he went through there. And oftentimes, or like I mentioned before, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, where they had people that were trying to manipulate them to worship, you know, the false images and whatnot, and Nebuchadnezzar. And, you know, that just is a theme throughout scripture. It's a theme uh, on my page with the people in the comment sections or the people that write me. And I noticed that one common theme of all of that is that the satanic attacks on us, they're not going to kill us. And we, we have to show our faith and then God can show himself super strong. So, for example, we mentioned Joseph. You know, he was in Potiphar's house as a slave and then he lived as a prisoner in the jail. And then all of a sudden he's governor over all the land. And then you, of course, got Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and they were going to lose their lives and and God rewarded them for their faith. And I think he's rewarded you and you feel so much closer to the father now because of what you went through and, and the protection that he provided, even though you were in the lion's den. He protected you from them, even though you they showed their fangs and they growled and roared and all that. But in the end, it was like a, a dog barking with no teeth. It was like, well, Haman. I mean, I've I've been Christian for four years. 
And, um, it, it's a learning process. You make mistakes, you, um, you figure it out. You know, it's not something where you just like the veil came down, you know, as soon as I accepted Christ, but it does still like sanctification takes time. You have to, you make a lot of mistakes. At least I have. But, um, so I just look at that and I'm like, if, you know, within two years of getting saved, I got that DWI because I needed the discipline. Right. And, so God used like, that. Right. And, um, you know, two lays, two years after that, I've been sober now two years. Um, you know, here I'm in this courthouse playing with fire and I'm like, I just look at the situation. And I'm like, if God's willing to use me in that situation, like, I don't really, I can't even grasp how he's going to use me down the road. I think sometimes he makes us stand up to bullies, and that's kind of what you did in there, where you said you let it slip, what you're really thinking, but he just, he wants the bullies to be stood up to, Not, and I'm not saying in a physical fighting sort of way, but I mean in a standing up to them way um, about what they're doing, and uh, you told the truth in there. And I, I truly believe that he led you to do that. And that was something that was almost, I don't want to say beyond your control, but it was definitely out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth spoke. And I think that was directed by him. And, you know, one other person that your situation reminds me of is Mordecai and Esther. And what happened in the book of Esther uh, with Haman, who was trying to have Mordecai hung on a gallows and he was trying to destroy all the Jews. And, you know, they prayed to God and fasted and, and put the matter before God and he protected them. And the gallows that he made for Mordecai to be hung with, Haman was hung on himself. So I just think that, you know, like I'm, like I said before that throughout scripture, there are, there are times where our faith is, like you said, tested and, and our resolve to do things God's way, even though people are constantly trying to manipulate us to do things Satan's way. And I really praise God for this steadiness and that He put in you and the the ability, the strength and the courage to to do what He led you to do. And sort of like Evan's testimony prior to yours, the last interview I did was that God did this with you alone. I, I'm not hearing you saying I went to church or Bible study and someone was helping me. I'm hearing you basically say to me. God's Holy Spirit was with you this whole time, and and you prayed to Him, and He led you and strengthened you. Is that a right interpretation on my part? Yeah, I mean, um, I got saved in 2014, and I really struggled initially because it was it wasn't an altar call, it wasn't um, anything like that, but it was one day I was just in just. And that was like at the height of my drinking. And um, I've never had that kind of despair. I usually am really resilient. And that can be such a stumbling block for people. What were you the drinking? More I was drink like in terms of my my drink of choice. Yes, Sam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I was drinking beer and wine, and I was a I was a binge drinker. So I wasn't even somebody who was like alcohol dependent. Meaning, if I cracked open a bottle of wine, I was going to drink that whole bottle of wine. And I don't even know why they make wine stoppers. You know, like it just didn't make sense to me. <laughs> but but my friends, they wouldn't look at me and say she's an alcoholic i wasn't messy i wasn't um i you wasn't promiscuous. i was functioning but i knew like my it, it was affecting you know how like you can steer your own conscience i knew mm. it was wrong and mm. especially after i went christian then you really get convicted because you know better mm. so but but when I came to Christ, it was 2014. I was in despair because my life was in shambles because I had ruined it and with alcohol. And, um, and I just, you know, it brought me to both knees. And I said, um, the only thing I, I don't remember all of it, but I just said, you know, 
I don't, I'm ignorant. I don't know anything about you, but you're the only person who can help me. And I want to know the truth. Praise God. And he hit me between the eyes big time. And that's when that discernment kicked in. Um, a lot of like YouTube channels would expose, you know, his response was, you don't know you don't know that there's evil in the world. So then I got exposed to like new world order and Illuminati and really deep stuff because I was so, um, naive. Mm. I thought, I thought everybody, you know, and I also thought I was good and this wasn't true. Like my heart was cold. Everyone's heart's cold who doesn't have Christ. So, so, and then on the third day, um, That's when I heard the gospel and, you know, just because you turn to Christ doesn't mean you're not going to be, you're not going to lose some of the temptation, but he'll always get you back on that path. So when I got that DWI, I knew that I was being disciplined and I was like, okay, that's a good thing. (laughs) Right. Because you told me, I think you told me when the first time we talked that you actually were pulled over in your own driveway, and that's when you Pretty got much. your yeah. So that that sounds like something God had done just for you. Yeah, <laughs> and I it was, worked, and it brought you through, and it taught you so much. And look what yeah. happened. You just did an over hour long podcast here where you have helped a lot of people with your testimony, and I definitely well, want to say need to know that absolutely. it's. You know, that they don't really have to go, but the judge is going to make you think you do. <laughs> right. There was somebody on your page who was talking about that they had to go to licensed treatment. And most of the licensed treatment is 12 step. So they have to know that there are options that are non 12 step and that they are licensed because I did it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was so- my point. Well, I sure do appreciate you coming on and giving your testimony and and just informing us about just how occultic and brainwashing and thought reform based AA is and how it's to the exclusion of Jesus Christ. And I just want to encourage anybody listening. This is our third uh, podcast in the series about AA, how it's unbiblical how it's it's truly not a Christian organization. It's exactly the opposite of that. It's satanic. And I just want to encourage anybody listening to take heed to Sarah's warning uh, and, and remember Evan's testimony and remember Sarah's testimony that they both were set free of drinking by God the Father through his son Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit dealing with them. And they're still free. And they're not uh, confessing every day that... Um, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. They, they know that he that's free in Christ is free indeed and that's what they are. And I just praise God for Sarah's testimony as well as Evan's and, and just appreciate you listener. If you would, uh, like, uh, to contact us, you may do so at withoutspot at gmail.com. That's also our PayPal handle. Everything we offer on our sites is free. Uh, but if you'd like to donate, that's uh, available to you at our paypal.com and handle without spot at gmail.com, or you can click below if this is if you're hearing this on the YouTube channel. Also, our blog spot is without spot or blemish.blogspot.com. And we also have a music site. It's reverbnation.com forward slash without spot or blemish ministry music. And you can download for free all the songs you find there. Both of those are links below as well. I want to thank you for listening. And we're just going to conclude with prayer. Father God, we praise you and thank you for just helping us with this podcast. You're, I felt your presence and I know that you, you gave us so much information through Sarah and I just appreciate what she's done. I'm asking for a pre- special blessing upon Sarah and her life going forward that you continue to guide her and lead her and all things and go before to make the crooked path straight and just continue to anoint her to do your work and to speak your word boldly and publicly as she's done here today and to um, lead many other people out of the bondage of 
uh, alcohol and into the freedom that is in Christ Jesus. I praise you and thank you for that blessing upon her. And bless everyone who listened, Father God, and those that are seeking deliverance from you. I'm asking you to touch each and every person that has an addiction. It doesn't have to be alcohol or drugs. It could be to sex or to pornography or to any vice or to food, to gluttony, to any vice, Father God. I'm asking you to just pour out your spirit on everyone listening and lead them into the same deliverance that you led Sarah and Evan and so many others into. That's the freedom that's in Christ Jesus. I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you on the next podcast of Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. Yes, the Lord is so good to me. And when I'm down and in of his love the Lord is so good to me when challenges arise from the enemy I stand fast in his love and I am set free for the Lord he is on my side and he will not be denied Cause the Lord is so good Yes, He's so good Oh, the Lord is so good to me Yes, the Lord is so good to me And when I'm down and in need of His love The Lord is so good to me When challenges arise from the enemy I stand fast in His love And I am set free For the Lord, He is on my side And He will not be denied The Lord is so good He is so good Yes, the Lord is so good to me